Good morning. I'm Linda Munson from the School of Veterinary Medicine at the University of California, Davis. And this morning I'm going to be talking to you about the diseases of wild felids. Many people have contributed to the work I'll be discussing, and I hope to acknowledge them as I be, am presenting their work. Could we have the first slide, please? The wild felids represent a fairly broad group of animals, which are represented in this very nice diagram um, from a book of Dr. Richard Montali, who's here at the National Zoo. Um, and down here at the base of this carnivore phylogeny, you see the felids represented. Now, many of the diseases I'll be talking about can be um, seen in both the panthera, or the large cats, as well as the felis, or the small, the genus which represents some of the small cats, and the other genus which is not represented in this phylogeny, which is asinonyx, or the diseases of cheetahs. Many of these diseases are also seen in other carnivores, and as I am discussing these diseases, I will talk about the um, compare and contrast the lesions of these diseases amongst some of the other carnivores. Because this symposium is being held in Uganda, and because I know your interest here is primarily in the diseases of wild felids, I'm going to be focusing most of my talk um, here this morning on the diseases of the African lion and the cheetah, because they're two of your major economic resources here in terms of ecotourism and the focus of a lot of disease concerns recently. Uh, before I start discussing some of the specific diseases, though, of these species, what I want to do is to put a little bit of the ecology of these animals into the perspective um, so that those can be incorporated into our understanding diseases, because no diseases in wild animals can be understood outside of the context of the ecology and behavior of these animals. One thing that has um, been discussed over the years is that diseases in wild animals differ significantly from those in captivity. But as we are seeing now in Africa, as well as worldwide, is all of our animal, wild animals are being um, sequestered in small ecosystems. They are present in these small parks, many of which are fenced. It's true in East Africa, in the Serengeti area. There's a lot of small parks in there where we find our wild felids, as well as other carnivores. Down in South Africa, too, there in Namibia, Botswana. Most of these um, wild felids are being sequestered in very small parks, many of which are fenced. This is a Tosha National Park in Namibia, um, which has both cheetah and lion populations, as well as other carnivores. And this park is completely fenced. So we are creating, by our national park system, a series of fragmented habitats in which there is no ability to disperse animals out of these habitats, resulting in essentially um, large zoo-like populations. So ba what we have learned over the last few decades in terms of our understanding of diseases in of um, these species in zoos, we are now finding apply um, all too often to these wild populations. Um, this is going to be um, more evident in some of our um, lions and other species, but the cheetah itself, as I will discuss in more detail later, is particularly an interesting species in terms of the amount of diseases we've seen in the captive population. We previously were not seeing them in the wild cheetahs, but we are now seeing them in cheetahs that are being captured, held in captivity, and translocated. So we are seeing that the diseases we've learned about in the zoo setting are now becoming very applicable to our wild populations. This is also true in the Serengeti. We have down here in the Norongora Conservation Area, the Norongora Crater, with a very unique population of lions in that area. These lions have not dispersed from this region in um, several decades represent a very homogeneic population and are very susceptible to diseases as a modulator of that population as a result of their um, physical isolation. Uh, this is just showing you cheetahs that are being translocated. As I mentioned, we are now finding that in these species that are being captured in these cages, translocated to other locations, sometimes held in facilities in the process of translocation are now acquiring the diseases we've been studying in the captive setting. Um, 
just a photograph of a cheetah being released. So we are now finding that in these small isolated populations, disease have a much greater impact. And so it's very important that we as pathologists understand, um, recognize these diseases, understand the basis for these diseases to help um, our colleagues in the field, our wildlife biologists, as well as government officials to understand how to um, manage these diseases because they do impact on these very valuable resources in, throughout Africa. Some of the things that occur in these small isolated um, parks is we see increasing homogeneity. This is particularly important in canids and felids because they, as, um, as a taxa, do not have much genetic um, variation um, originally simply because they have behaviors where, for instance, the alpha animals are the ones to breed, or you have prides in which there seems to be some genetic um, homogeneity naturally. On top of that, if you prevent dispersion to occur within these populations, you increase homogeneity, and with that comes increase in genetic diseases and a decreased ability to um, respond in a um, heterogeneic fashion to infectious agents. You also get um, more concentrations of pathogens within these environments um, or their intermediate hosts. You get degradation of the environment in terms of diet, um, and you also get increased contact with domestic and exotic species in these areas. When you start translocating animals, you, you start putting animals that have co-evolved with their pathogens into new environments where new pathogens are um, encountered, and you can get an increase in disease having much more of an impact on these small carnivore populations. Um, what we as pathologists need to determine over the next few years in working with our other colleagues is whether disease is going to start affect the viability of these populations. And to do that, we have to capitalize on every opportunity we have to collect information on these diseases. For instance, when animals are being translocated, this is a cheetah under anesthesia, we need to um, determine what diseases they've been exposed to by getting serological information, take samples, um, and get as much data as we can. When we have an opportunity to um, necropsy an animal, again, we should take comprehensive samples from this and determine what diseases are inherent in these populations and what are the causes of mortality. However, what this is creating, which is something we're going to have to sort out over time, is an enormous amount of data that we do not yet know the significance of. For, for instance, we will find a lot of animals with a positive serological test, but those aren't necessarily animals that have a significant disease. We have animals with clinical signs, but again, those signs may be specific for the disease or may be due to something else. Animals with a whole variety of microorganisms, and again, the significance of those microorganisms are not yet known. So what we need to do over time is create databases and follow these diseases to determine which of them are actually significant in terms of population viability. Some other um, factors that are important in the ecology of diseases in wild felids is their behavior. You have to understand what the conspecific and interspecific interactions, their territory range, as well as how they um, mark their territory and their um, denning characteristics. These are all things that can affect the um, transmission of infectious diseases amongst these animals. For instance, in lions, they are an incredibly social felid, and so if an infectious disease gets into a lion population, it is easily transmitted um, amongst the members of the pride. This is less true for um, solitary species like the leopard. However, all of these species interact at kill sites, as you're seeing here, then as well as interacting with other species, such as the hyena. So you can get transmission of infectious diseases um, intraspecifically at kill sites. In terms of territory range and territory marking, species that have a very narrow territory range, um, as do the lions, they work in prides and have a small um, range of that pride, they tend to concentrate microorganisms within that area and don't transmit between prides as commonly as would occur in a species that has a very, very large territory range like the cheetah, the cheetah out in the wild, which they have enormous territory ranges and so there's a dispersal of infectious agents within that environment. 
However, the cheetah has a behavior that can also cause transmission of, of disease. This is a play tree in Namibia, and cheetahs mark their territory at these play trees and leave feces and urine at that site, and can, which can be a source of infectious agents. Other cheetahs come to that site, also urine and um, feces mark, and so the, the play tree can be a source of infectious um, agent transmission in species like the cheetah. In terms of denning, um, unlike ungulates in which the young are widely dispersed within the environment, we tend to have um, uh, dens uh, in, for our felids and canids. This is a very beautiful picture out of the book The Painted Wolf by Jonathan Scott. Um, showing the den where you have the pups in this den and you can imagine that there's a concentration of both parasites and infectious agents within these areas. So you will find that you can get a very high concentration of pathogens in these areas and a tra transmission amongst all members of the litter due to this denning behavior. The other factor in the canids and felids that's important in terms of their acquisition of disease is that they are at the top of the food chain. so they. Anything that is in the food chain below them will be concentrated and acquired by them. For instance, any toxins or infectious agents. Uh, for instance, anthrax in cattle um, can be acquired because they will eat the carcass with anthrax and acqu acquire the carnivore form of anthrax. Um, or in, in the case of tuberculosis, and I'll discuss this in more detail when I'm talking about that with the lions, where the the prey source for the lion is highly infected with tuberculosis, and so as a being at the top of the food chain, they are much more susceptible to acquire that infection than would other species of felid or canid who do not use that as a prey source. They also are very susceptible to infectious agents from domestic dogs and cats, and as we mentioned with these small fragmented populations which have domestic animals right up to their borders, they are constantly now being exposed to these infectious agents and um, are much more susceptible um, to these diseases. There's cheetahs coming. They are ranging in Namibia right near the farmlands. This is a photograph by, that given to me by Laurie Marker showing that the cheetahs come right into the farmlands and are clearly exposed to those infectious agents that are carried by the domestic dogs and cats in that area. So with this perspective, I'd like to start discussing the diseases of the African lion and using um, as an example um, of the impact of behavior and ecology in the emergence and um, spread of an infectious agent, I'd like to first discuss the canine distemper viral epidemic that occurred here in Africa in the Serengeti. Before I go into the details of the um, clinical signs and the pathology of this, though, I would like to acknowledge all of the colleagues um, who assisted with this project. This is a multidisciplinary international collaboration that helped resolve um, um, solve the, the mystery of the deaths of the lion in the Serengeti. We have Dr. Max Appel, who is from Cornell University, who is um, an expert on canine distemper, as well as Dr. Brian Summers, a pathologist, also an expert on canine distemper. Dr. Pospisko from um, Switzerland. We have our geneticist from the National Cancer Institute, um, all the field biologists and veterinarians involved in the project, both in the United States, in England, in Kenya, and in um, the pathologists in Tanzania at Sokoina University, as well as the virologists that worked in it. So it was a multidisciplinary project. It also required the collaboration and cooperation of um, these foundations and who allowed us to um, work on the solution of this um, epidemic. Where the epidemic occurred is in the Serengeti which is one of the, has one of the largest um, wild carnivore populations in the world, a very diverse um, ecosystem, um, in which in late 1994 they started noticing that the lions were um, becoming more aggressive within the packs, I mean, I'm sorry, within the prides. There was increased pride aggression and fighting. Um, and many more lion carcasses were found than had been previously found in this area. It began, it was first noticed in the Serenera 
district in the center of the Serengeti where there was a long-term lion project um, ongoing that Dr. Craig Packer from University of Minnesota was currently heading up. They had about, se since 1975, had been monitoring about 250 lions representing 14 prides in this area and had excellent demographic data on terms of mortality statistics. So they were able to determine that this was clearly an increase in mortality. This is one of the lions that was found. You can see it's quite emaciated. Uh, you can see that there is this, these bite wounds, infected bite wounds throughout the um, body, severe cellulitis in these animals. Um, and then in early 1994, they noticed that lions had be, a, a balloon, tour, a tourist on a balloon ride was um, able to record this uh, male lion in the, in the midst of a grand mal seizure. It was quite a famous um, photograph. And at this point, we were determined that there was a neurological disease affecting the lions at the time. Some of the other neurological signs that were found is ataxia and myoclonus. This is a picture from Dr. Craig Packer in which this lion has got a facial and forelimb tick, very typical of the type of myoclonus that is seen with canine distemper in dogs. Um, also at the time, many lions were noted to be extremely emaciated and doing quite poorly in f despite the um, plentitude of game at the time. So there was just a lot of vague signs. This is the Serengeti Lion Project, um, which was on site at the time and based on the basis of their data. This is showing the size of the Serengeti Lion population that they've been studying from 1975 to 1995. You can see the population was quite dense, very, very high numbers, immediately preceding the epidemic, and then a rapid drop where they lost about a third of the animals in that study. Dr. Melody Rolke was the veterinarian on site at the time, and she was able to do some fairly comprehensive necropsies. What she found at necropsy was lymphadenopathy, a lot of b infected bite wounds again, cellulitis, but not very many specific um, findings. Sometimes the lungs were slightly consolidated, but basically there were no descriptive, um, distinctive um, gross lesions. This is a histological section of the lungs from one of the lions from the epidemic. You can see the alveoli septi over here are fairly normal, and then there are these multifocal areas of thickening of the alveoli septi with type 2 pneumocyte hyperplasia, um, a very minimal um, interstitial inflammatory reaction. And again, this lesion was fairly minor, um, multifocal, and not particularly prominent. She's showing another, another section with interstitial pneumonia, type 2 pneumocyte hyperplasia, and rarely you would find areas in which there were small aggregates of neutrophils. If we look at higher magnification in some of these areas, again, type 2 pneumocyte hyperplasia. And if you look carefully in some of the cells, you can see intracytoplasmic eosinophilic inclusion bodies in the type 2 pneumocytes. Again, very difficult to find, a very subtle lesion. Just another section, again, showing type 2 pneumocyte hyperplasia. And rarely you would get giant cells, multinucleated giant cells in the alveoli septi, but I'm sorry, in the alveolar space that were either exfoliated syncytial cells from the epithelium or were um, macrophages, syncytial macrophages. Also within the lymphoid tissue, there was marked lymphoid depletion. This is a lymph node from one of the affected lions. And if you look carefully within the lymphoid tissue, you can find both um, intracytoplasmic and intranuclear inclusions. Try to find one for you here. There's one. Very subtle intracytoplasmic and intranuclear inclusions with marked lymphoid depletion. There were also cytoplasmic inclusions in the epididymis. This is the epididymis from one of the affected lions. Here's your cytoplasmic inclusion. 
and in the central nervous system, the lesions were confined to the hippocampus and parahippocampus gyri. This is showing you a low magnification from one of the lions. You can see fairly normal hippocampus down in this region, and then disruption and necrosis and gliosis in a few of these areas. I'll show you a higher magnification. Again, there is necrosis of neurons in this area, disruption of the normal architecture, a very minor, mild um, gliosis in this area. And if we look at higher magnification, you can find intracytoplasmic inclusions, syncytia, multinucleated cells, and both um, intranuclear and intracytoplasmic inclusions. Here's a good example of an intranuclear inclusion, and there are intracytoplasmic inclusions. Here's an excellent example of an intracytoplasmic inclusion. But the inclusions were very rare and difficult to find in these lesions. There was virtually no inflammatory reaction, only very, very few lymphocytes in a few um, perivascular cuffs, but it was basically just a um, necrosis and a micro and astrogliosis. This is an immunohistochemical stain using monoclonal antibodies. Um, this work was done by Dr. Brian Summers at Cornell University using the monoclonal antibodies um, kindly provided by Klaus Orbell from Sweden, in which you can see that there is abundant um, canine distemper um, antigen present within these lesions, both in the nucleus and in the cytoplasm, considerably more antigen than was evident from the inclusion body seen on the H&E slides. This is again an immunohistochemical stain with anti-canine distemper viral antibodies in the lung, showing an enormous amount of an viral antigen present within the pneumocytes, the type 2 pneumocytes, and throughout the lung tissue. And you can appreciate from looking at this slide how much viral antigen would have been shed in these animals um, by respiratory secretions with coughing um, and the spread amongst the pride members from the viral antigens from lung sources. So the tissue tropism in the felids in the lions at the time was different than you would normally expect with canine distemper. Um, lymphotropism, of course, is very normal, and neurotropism is also very normal. However, the neurotropism was primarily hippocampal and was not in the regions of the brain that we typically see canine distemper virus in canids. It was also pneumotropic, um, but very minor lesions, very difficult to identify, and we had very minimal epithelial lesions, unlike how we expect canine distemper to present um, histopathologically in canids. If we look at the distribution of canine viral um, distemper viral inclusions in the tissue, you could see that there were some in the brain, they were, but they were very rare. This is, represents the number of lions we had those tissues from. Um, you could find them rarely in bile ducts in the epididymis, but you will notice that the urothelium from either the urinary bladder or the kidney is not present there, nor is the stomach. So we did not find them in those usual epithelial locations. Dr. Melody Roki also anesthetized um, many lions at the time to try to get more clinical pathological information on the impact of canine distemper on the lions. She found at the time a marked lymphadenopathy in these anesthetized lions. Um, as well as a very high seroprevalence, indicating that many of the lions that at the time she anesthetized them, which was in around April of 1994, that many of the lions had already been exposed to and recovered from the canine distemper epidemic. They also had a, an anemia with a low PCV, a leukocytosis, but a lymphopenia, again at the time that they had already seroconverted. So these are residual signs. Um, at the time, the low PCV was thought possibly due to a copathogen, such as um, ty these Tyleria-like hemoparasites that are seen in lion blood. Um, I should also say, while I have this slide up, that other copathogens were considered as 
um, possible reasons for the high um, prevalence of disease and high mortality of the disease in the lion population at the time. But when statistical analyses were done between those lions, for instance, that were FIV positive and FIV negative, there was no difference in mortality statistics between these populations. Likewise, panleukopenia virus, um, which can cause an a immunosuppression, was not found to be more prevalent in either the of the populations, either those that survived versus those that died during the epidemic. If we look at these Tyleria-like parasites, they were very prevalent in the population at the time. This is the these Tyleria-like organisms that are found in lions, but these are very common in lions throughout Africa and were not correlated with the mortality within the population. They also were not um, the cause of the anemia because when we gave this virus from the Serengeti to domestic cats in an SPF, SPF cats in a laboratory situation in which there were no other pathogens present, they also developed an anemia in response to this virus. So we feel like this is a primary effect of this new biotype of canine distemper virus. Some of the other carnivores in the Serengeti that were also affected this are the bat-eared fox. They were had considerable mortality due to the distemper epidemic at the time. This is showing the typical catarrhal um, inflammatory response, um, ocular nasal discharge seen with canine distemper, quite normal appearance of canine distemper in a canid. In the battered fox, we found again lymph, um, lymphoid depletion and necrosis in a lymph node. Um, this is an immunohistochemical stain. All of these brown um, areas are the presence of canine distemper virus in these lymph nodes, a higher magnification, again, demonstrating abundant viral proteins present on, in the sites of the lesion. Interestingly, the lesions in the lung in the, in the battered fox were con considerably different than that we saw in the cats in that they seem to be more bronchial, bronchial associated and not interstitial. This is a bronchus from one of the battered fox. You can see this extensive necrosis of the epithelium and exfoliation um, of the syncytial cells with internuclear and intracytoplasmic inclusions. So quite a different um, bronchial associated lesion which was not seen in the lions that were examined at the time. This is the adrenal medulla from one of the battered foxes. Again, a distinctive lesion in the foxes that was not seen in the lions. Um, you find these very, very large syncytial cells with both internuclear and intracytoplasmic inclusion. The nuclear, internuclear inclusions are most prominent in this slide. And an adrenal gland from a battered fox showing abundant canine distemper viral antigens both in the adrenal medulla and multifocally within the cortex. Again, this lesion was not seen in the felids. Also seen in the battered fox with a more typical urothelial um, infection with, this is a urinary bladder from one of the foxes with syncytial cells, internuclear inclusions, and intracytoplasmic inclusions. So we're seeing a much more typical pattern of canine distemper viral infection in the canids infected at the time. Also we saw in the battered fox, um, this is an oviduct with immunohistochemically stained for canine distemper viral antigens, and you can see that there's abundant viral antigens present in the oviduct, suggesting that there can be um, vertical as well as horizontal transmission of the disease. Also in the battered fox, we found um, what looked like hard pad disease. This is a foot pad from one of these foxes. Abundant canine distemper viral antigens again present in the foot pad. And you show a higher magnification with the hyperkeratosis that is very typical of hard pad disease. Again, this is the viral antigens present here in the basal epithelium and hyperkeratosis of the foot pads. This, of course, could also have been a source of transmission of the virus in the Serengeti because these viral infected cells could exfoliate um, and be transmitted to other animals. So if we look at the distribution of viral inclusion in the battered fox, it's a much more typical of what we um, expect with canine distemper in our domestic dogs with the lymphoid tissue, bronchial inclusions, um, biliary and urothelial um, inclusions. Interestingly, we found none in the brain, but that might be because we um, caught the disease much earlier um, before 
in, in the infection before it had reached the brain. And of course, um, in, as I mentioned earlier, the battered fox were highly susceptible to this with s quite rapid um, and extensive mortalities. Also infected at the time um, were the hyena, the spotted hyena within the, the Serengeti, um, with a pattern of infection that was much um, more typical of the felids than the canids. Uh, again, lymphoid tissues and lungs, and it was interstitial. We found them in the hippocampus area of the brain again. Um, so it was much more typical of the felid uh, pattern of disease than the canid pattern of disease in hyenas. Also, interestingly, we found in hyenas a evidence of vertical transmission. One of the hyenas was pregnant, and this is a fetal thymus. You can see there's marked lymphoid depletion and necrosis within the fetal thymus. And on higher magnification, if you um, look at the epithelial cells, you can see intranuclear and intracytoplasmic inclusions, which were confirmed to be canine distemper. So we did have transplacental transmission of disease in the hyenas. So if we look at the overall pattern of the epidemic within the Serengeti, um, this is the time course it took. In December, there was this increased aggression within prides, which was probably the onset of the epidemic. The neurological signs, which were the most notable signs clinically, were not seen till February, which probably means that the epidemic was well underway at the time. Um, in March, lions with myoclonus were observed, which of course is the chronic form of canine distemper. And so by the time the pathologist got on board there, which was in about March, you can see that the epidemic had come and gone. By April, as I mentioned, the, there was high seropositivity at the time. And of course, seropositivity means those animals have been infected and recovered from the disease. And so by June of the following year, all mortality um, included both those lions which were necropsied as well as the majority of them which just disappeared, you could see that the mortality was estimated at about 30 percent of the entire population. What subsequently happened, if you look at this map of the Serengeti where the epidemic originated was here in Serenera, in the center of the Serengeti. It then spread out toward the Norongoro Crater region and then up toward Kenya and was found to be infecting lions here in the Masamara and other areas of Kenya at the time. That, of course, is all part of the, the Serengeti ecosystem. So in August of that year, um, lions with seizures or myoclonus were noted in the Masamara National Park. And Dr. Richard Koch went out into the field with his colleagues and immobilized lions and acquired serum and found out that 43 percent of the Kenyan lions at the time had already seroconverted. And their mortality statistics were estimated at about 25 percent. So very high mortality from this infectious disease throughout the entire ecosystem. So if we look overall at what species were affected by the virus, uh, the lions were the most severely affected, again, probably because their population was so dense at the time of the epidemic and the fact that they are incredibly social felids and could have considerable transmission within prides at the time. A leopard was um, found that had lesions typical of canine distemper virus, but the um, animal was too autolyzed to be able to confirm it with immunohistochemistry. We did show that spotted hyena and bat-eared fox were infected. A cheetah was th seen at the time with myoclonus, which of course would be very, is very typical of the chronic form of canine distemper. And a domestic dog um, was proven to have had canine distemper virus. So if we look at what had happened to this virus at the time, this is very interesting um, historical change. We can see that although a few lions had, and other large cats, from Panthera species, from the Panthera species, had had distemper, um, recorded one or two ep episodes over this entire period of time. It wasn't until 1991 in the epidemics that were de described by Dr. Max Appel and his colleagues um, at Cornell in California and Illinois, in which there was a sudden very large epidemic affecting multiple large cats in the United States. You then look at the epidemic in the Serengeti and then subsequent small epidemics in 
lions and tigers throughout the United States and actually worldwide. We've heard of epidemics in India and in Japan. You can see that there's clearly been a change in this morbili virus to be much more pathogenic for felids. If we look at the same pattern in hyenas, you can see that although there were some suspicious cases, none of which were documented in 1907 and in 1947 in zoos, it wasn't until the epidemic in 1993 and 4 in the Serengeti that hyenas were thought to be susceptible to canine distemper with um, high numbers of mortality. So if you look at what distemper has done over time and its host range, you can see that it wasn't until again 1990 that the felids and the hyenas were considered to be um, susceptible hosts. So what does this mean in terms of the virus? If you look at the, cana the carnivore phylogeny, um, previous to this time here in the canid group, all of these species were considered to be susceptible to canine distemper, both the viverids and the procyonids, as well as the typical canids. But it wasn't until this, the 1990s that this whole group in the felidae, both the, the, um, the hyenas as well as the cats, became the host that in which this became very pathogenic. So the virus has jumped across this phylogenetic branch to now affect the felidae equally with the canidae and other species. So it, the question was, what happened to the virus to make it more pathogenic? Um, some virus was obtained by PCR from, some fresh, from two fresh lions, but otherwise viral isolation had not been successful. It wasn't until this small cub was found by Dr. Melody Roki in grand mal seizures. She got permission to euthanize it and necropsy it, sent the very fresh tissues to Max Appel, who was able to isolate the virus using his dog lymphocyte culture system. And then taking that virus, um, Dr. Uh, Steve O'Brien and, and Dr. Margaret Carpenter at National Cancer Institute were able to sequence sufficient amounts of the virus. This is the um, phylogenetic tr uh, analysis of the section of the P gene that they, which is a nuclear protein gene, which is highly conserved among mobility virus, to show how this virus from the distemper epidemic in the Serengeti was related to other canine distemper viral um, prototypes as well as the other mobility viruses. So if you look, this is canine distemper virus. These are two lions from the Serengeti. Um, this is uh, the phocid distemper virus, the dolphin and porpoise virus, as well as measles virus, rinderpest, and the pest de petit ruminant. Just showing all the relatedness of these viruses, you can see that the Serengeti virus was very closely related to the canine distemper, but distinctive. Again, this is a highly conserved nuclear gene, just to show what family of morbili virus it fell into. However, a less conserved gene is the H gene, and the H gene is used, and you can see that, that the relatedness amongst these viruses is much greater. The length of these branches indicates related the closeness of it. You can see that the other genes are much more closely related. If you look at this H gene, which is the gene that codes for proteins on the surface of the morbili virus, this is using measles as an example, which interacts with cell receptors and determines both species and cell tropism. Um, if you, this is the gene that would be most likely to be mutated to allow this to be more pathogenic to felids. And when this group looked at the H gene, um, here is the whole Serengeti epidemic. You can see that there is a distinct group of, um, from all these different animals that's separate from the other distemper groups. Here's domestic dogs. Um, here's some of the animals that were affected in the United States. You can see the vaccine strain of distemper down here. So this does help separate out the distemper um, family of viruses. And so you can see that this is a distinctive virus. It's clearly part of the canine distemper family, but it has acquired um, mutations within this gene that codes for the surface, pro the f surface protein on the virus that modulates, um, that uh, allows the, the, to interact with cell surface proteins for cell uptake and pathogenicity. So we think that's probably why it has changed to become more pathogenic for felids. Where did the virus come from has been a question. This is some work from Sarah Gascoigne with the domestic dogs. 
um, serology in the area, you can see that, it, that distemper is endemic in all the domestic dogs surrounding the Serengeti Reserve. However, there was an increase in infective rates in these, the southern and eastern areas around the Serengeti previous to the epidemic here in early 1993 and 94. So we think that probably the virus came from the domestic dogs in the area, but somehow was transported into the middle of the Serengeti and that the most likely transport host was the hyena because the hyenas will come out of the park, intermix with the domestic dogs, and then go into the middle of the Serengeti with their huge host ranges and interact with lions at kill sites. So we assume that that was how the virus got into the Serengeti. The population has since recovered. Um, there has been an enormous um, success in uh, the survival of offspring. There's been a lot of litters born in the last couple of years, and the population is returning to its normal um, state. However, on this, we expect this to be transient. When you have an epidemic of this sort, you will have an immune population temporarily, and we assume that a large part portion of the population is still immune. However, all these cubs being born recently, over the last couple of years, will of course be susceptible to an increase to an epidemic, and if the virus again enters the Serengeti, we can probably predict that there will be an epidemic in probably within 10 years. What ha has happened with distemper in other parts of Africa, it has not been reported yet in Namibia or South Africa, although there are seropositive animals in that area. Um, in 1995, there was an epidemic in African wild dogs here in Botswana, so we know that the distemper has moved down into this area, but no felids have been reported to be affected in that area. So we do not know if this is the same biotype of virus as affected the animals, the felids, and the hyenas up here in the Serengeti. This is just the African wild dogs that were, um, Dr. Kathy Alexander um, reported that epidemic in Botswana. Also, we've had some other manifestations of distemper in the captive population. This is a tiger. Um, um, that these samples are sent to me by Dr. Ken Cameron, in which it had a chronic, the chronic um, encephalomyelitis form of canine distemper with very, very prominent lymphoid cuffs. This was, the animal was chronically infected, it was becoming ataxic and then pyretic. Um, and you can see that there's a typical demyelination that occurs with the chronic forms of distemper, very different from what we saw in the acute form in the canine distemper epidemics in um, the Serengeti. Again, a marked lymphocytic reaction, unlike what we were seeing in the other cats, and a typical demyelination um, of canine distemper with abundant antigen present, again, an immunohistochemical stain, uh, showing abundant antigen present in this case. So we are seeing new manifestations of distemper uh, in our captive thing. We've also had it reported in small wild felids out of Canada. There have been bobcats reported with the disease and isolated cases worldwide. So clearly distemper is here to stay and we just need to be aware of the subtleness of the lesions in the, in the cats so that this does not get overlooked. Some of the other very important diseases that we see in lions are, um, besides the canine distemper, is tuberculosis. Um, immunodeficiency virus, I'll also talk about in a minute. It's not so much an important disease so much as an important virus within the population, the significance of which has not yet been sorted out. The tuberculosis issue, however, is becoming extremely um, critical in Africa. There are several populations in South Africa in which the lions have been um, severely impacted by uh, tuberculosis down here in Kruger National Park, um, in uh, the Umfalozi National Park down in South Africa, as well as in Queen Elizabeth National Park up here in Uganda. There have been um, lions detected with tuberculosis. Before 1995, um, only lions and zoos had been detected, so this is an emergence of a disease in the wild population. Tuberculosis is um, an exotic disease in Africa. It was brought in in the 1950s with domestic cattle and transmitted to the wildlife um, in, that, in these areas. Um, according to Dr. Nick Creek at, um, at Understaport, 
who's working on this project in uh, the Cougar National Park. There is about a 80 percent infection rate in the buffalo now in that area. The buffalo is the major prey source for lions in that area, and so lions are um, acquiring this infection from their normal prey source. What Prof. Crick um, reports to me concerning the lesions that they're seeing um, is the lions are um, becoming quite emaciated. They have alopecia. Despite the fact that there's an abundant prey in the area, they are quite emaciated. They have um, fight wounds and bite wounds, very similar to the gross lesions that were seen with the canine distemper. Um, what he's reporting uh, in terms of the lesions that they're seeing are these co uh, coalescing and caseating granulomas, um, which have only been found in the lungs. Sometimes the lungs are diffusely consolidated. Sometimes there are discrete granulomas or these coalescing granulomas. He describes, um, I should say that this, this is a, a cumulative slide, including the lesions that have been seen both in the captive and in the wild animals. So in the captive animals, the, there have also been granulomas described in the intestines and the lymph node, but Prof Creek has not reported those lesions in the Kruger lions. How he has found the lung lesions that's quite distinctive is that within these granulomas, there's a thick mucoid exudate. Um, they do not um, appear to be mineralized very often, and some have no discrete granulomas but just a diffuse consolidation of the lung. Uh, this is a histological slide showing um, one of the lions in which there's just this, this granulomatous pneumonia. You see some um, giant cells within the, uh, the alveolar spaces. Um, only rarely do you see these caseous or mineralized center. This is the exception rather than the rule. And the other distinctive thing about the lion lesions that he has reported is that there are not the typical giant cells that you see um, in other species. This is an acid fast stain showing there's abundant um, mycobacteria present in the lesions, although that it depends on the individual. Some lions do not have many organisms present. This is a lymph node from a captive animal showing again this rather diffuse granulomatous reaction, not many giant cells, not usually a very discrete granuloma formed, and variable amounts of acid fast bacteria present. Why the, why the lions get this? It's thought to um, be due to the fact that, again, the buffalo is their main um, infected source in the environment. Um, they kill the lion, the, the, the lions kill the buffalo by strangulating them, so they're probably a, um, inhaling infective material from the lungs of the buffaloes. Um, and there's also questions currently as to whether FIV, which is quite prevalent in the lion in the population at the time, is impacting on their susceptibility. The lions then, because of their social nature, are transmitting it within the prides, and so they think that there's both an acquisition of it by ingestion and, inf and um, aspiration at the kill site it, during the process of killing, and then transmission among the prides through the coughing and spread of infectious material. In the last tape, we were discussing the diseases of African lions um, and discussed the canine distemper problem in the Serengeti, as well as the tuberculosis problem that's currently present in Africa. I want to continue in the next section talking about more of the diseases that are present in lions. Specifically, the first one is this papillomaviral infection, which has been reported in Asian lions by Dr. Dick Montali, John Sunberg, and others, um, but has also been seen in African lions, characterized by these sublingual plaques, um, which are histologically, I'll show you some um, histology slides in a moment, focal epithelial hyperplasia, um, and are caused by a new type of papillomavirus, the Panthera papillomavirus. These are probably just incidental findings, but it's important to recognize them. This is a black and white photo out of the publication I was just mentioning by Sunberg, Montali, and others, in which you'll have these sublingual um, plaques, these white plaques under the tongue, varying sizes. And if you look at those <coughs> histologically, 
They represent these locally extensive areas of epithelial hyperplasia, uh, higher magnification. You can begin to appreciate the characteristic lesions of papillomavirus in that you have coilocytosis up in this area, the epithelium, again, epithelial hyperplasia. But also unique to this virus and quite distinctive are these discrete intracytoplasmic inclusions that look very similar to pox virus. If we go one higher magnification, again, coilocytosis with your internuclear inclusions and perinuclear clearing, um, marked hyperplasia of the epithelium, and then these discrete intracytoplasmic inclusions. What these intracytoplasmic inclusions are, are cytoplasmic proteins. They are not viral pro proteins, but are ca uh, associated with infection with the virus. So the virus causes the accumulation of these proteins in the cells. But the distinctive features, again, intranuclear inclusions, coilocytotic changes, and cytoplasmic inclusions in this virus. As I mentioned earlier, I wanted to just briefly talk about the current status of feline immunodeficiency virus infection in lions. Many of the populations throughout Africa have high seroprevalence. Um, it's close to 85% in some of these populations um, with little evidence that it's impacting on their health, which suggests, suggests that lions have co-evolved with this virus. What we are not certain about, however, is what happens to lions that have not co-evolved with this virus, for instance, those present in Namibia, which are seronegative. If they were to become infected with this virus, would it have an impact on their health? Um, the question within both captive and wild li lions is, does FIV actually cause disease? There has been suggestion in some FIV-positive animals that the virus is associated with neurologic disease, particularly behavioral changes, um, increased aggression. Um, Dr. Suzanne kennedy Stoska from North Carolina has demonstrated that there are retinal lesions in both captive and wild lions, particularly the lions in Kruger National Park in South Africa. So there is a correlation with retinal lesions and FIV positive status. However, the clinical impact of those retinal lesions has not yet been have been determined. Um, it's not known if there's any impact upon the uh, lymphoid function and immune status of these animals. All of these diseases I'm mentioning down in here are actually the, the effects of FIV in domestic cats. Um, currently, we do not know if any of these, uh, have not been able to find any of these um, associations in lions. If you look throughout Africa, again, you have populations throughout of lions throughout eastern Africa and southern Africa with high seropositivity, again, with only evidence of retinal disease. Um, Dr. Kenny Skofkoff is currently trying to determine if there is a shift in CD4, CD8 ratio and has some preliminary data supporting that there is some immune modulation by this virus. But currently, there is no definitive evidence that FIV causes disease. Um, Dr. Steve O'Brien's lab at National Cancer Institute um, has determined that there are three different clades or biotypes of FIV virus in these populations, and they are currently trying to determine if any one of these three biotypes is more pathogenic and more highly correlated with disease. As I mentioned with the canine distemper epidemic, if you looked at the overall positivity for FIV, versus mortality within the population, there was no association. But Dr. O'Brien and Melody Rolke at um, NCI are currently trying to determine if one of these biotypes was associated with higher mortality. <clears throat> we look at an another very unusual disease of lions. It's this lesion that's seen in the liver of I've only seen it actually in captive lions. I don't know if anyone has um, seen it in wild lions, although it has not been reported. This is the liver of a captive lion with these large multilogulated. In the last tape, we were discussing some of the infectious diseases of cheetahs and the fact that cheetahs develop rather unusual manifestations and more severe diseases when infected with common feline viruses, as well as the very prevalent and severe gastritis that they develop in association with Helicobacter.
We're now going to continue with some of these infectious diseases and cheetahs. I want to reiterate the fact that they do not appear to be immunosuppressed in the classical sense, as has been suspected from their genetic homogeneity, but in fact that they have what appears to be a florid plasmacytic response to these infectious agents, which is more typical of a Th type 2 response. We're now going to talk about cryptococcus and some of the fungal diseases that we see in cheetahs. There have been um, several cases identified both in the United States and South Africa in which cheetahs have developed both the pulmonary, um, dermal, and CNS forms of the disease. The disease is very typical of cryptococ cryptococcosis in all species in that they develop these granulomas in the lungs as well as a meningoencephalitis. There's nothing unusual about the manifestation of it in cheetahs other than the seemingly higher prevalence in this species than in other species. Again, this is cryptococcal dermatitis, a section, histological section of skin from a cheetah with this mar marked um, infiltration of the cryptococcus and just the typical organism. So nothing unique about the organism, just a higher prevalence in the cheetah than in other species. <coughs> Another interesting um, disease in high prevalence in certain populations of cheetahs has been Notoides cati. It's the typical um, mange of cheetahs, often confused with sarcoptic mange, although this is the, um, the mange mite that causes it in cheetahs. This has occurred predominantly in wild cheetahs um, under stressful conditions. It was reported in Kruger National Park in association with cheetahs that were recently um, released, translocated. They developed severe systemic um, notoritis cat die and several of them died. I recently heard at this meeting in the symposium in Uganda that there were also some cheetahs that were highly stressed by the tourists in East Africa that also developed severe mange in response to this, um, you know, to the stress of the tourists. The lesion is typical of sarcoptic mange or notoedris cati mange in any species. You get this hyperplasia of the epithelium. This is a histological section of the skin from one of the affected cheetahs. In, um, in this case, it was one from Serengeti, the sample provided by Dr. Melody Rolke. Again, very severe hyperkeratotic um, reaction, acanthosis, and the typical um, mites found deep in the epithelium. Nothing unique about the reaction again, just the circumstances under which it occurs and the severity of the reaction in cheetahs. Again, hyperkeratosis, parakeratosis, and the notoedris mite present within the lesions. <coughs> there are several infectious diseases that cheetahs acquire through their diet. Um, one of the more notable ones that was found predominantly in cheetahs has not been found in any of the other big cats, the panthera, is the spongiform encephalopathy that was acquired um, from captive diets in Britain. This is all part of the BSE um, epidemic that was occurring at the time. Several of the zoo um, cats um, in England were given some of the infected meat unknowingly at the time. This was before the outbreak was really recognized. Um, and subsequently developed um, over several years clinical signs of spongiform encephalopathy. Um, again, it was interesting that the cheetahs were the ones that acquired this uh, problem, and it was not seen in any of the panthera in the same collections that were fed the same diet. Um, obviously, they were fed, uh, they were infected by ingestion. Um, there's been no evidence of any horizontal transmission, as would be expected. Um, and I'll get to some. Um, contrasting diseases here when I talk more about these other diseases. These are two very prominent um, problems, neurologic problems we're seeing in captive populations in the U.S. and Europe. So the spongiform encephalopathy has only been seen um, in the U.K. cheetahs, some, one of which unfortunately was moved to Australia before it was detected, but again there's been no horizontal transmission. The lesion is very typical of spongiform encephalopathy. In other species, this is the Australian cheetah, which I was fortunate enough to acquire some material. You can see that it's this typical spongiosis present within the, um, the vacuolation within the neuropel. 
And if you look at higher magnification, you can see that it's definitely associated with vacuoles within the neurons as, as well as within some of the neurites and in the axons. So it's a very typical um, spongiform change um, associated with neurons and their, their projections in the, in the um, central nervous system. <coughs> Just another case, again, showing typical spongiform change in the associated with the nerves. Very different from the sort of diffuse spongiform change you can see. I'll show you some cases later. Other um, diseases they can acquire through diet. Again, when I talked about the lions in the first tape, we talked about tuberculosis. Um, what's unusual about tuberculosis infection that has been seen in Kruger National Park, um, again, this was information um, sent to me by Prof. Nick Crick, um, is that they have um, they have acquired it um, through some other means, presumably, than the buffalo, because they, buffalo is not a typical prey species for the cheetah. What they have determined in their studies is that there has been transmission of the infection to kudu, and kudu is a typical prey species of the cheetah. So presumably, that was the source of the tuberculosis infection in cheetahs. And the lesions were the same as I described for the lions. They have a, a multifocal to coalescing to diffuse granulomatous pneumonia, predominantly um, pleural lesions um, and pneumonic lesions, lungs, lesions in the lung and not involving the lymph nodes or the GI tract as has been reported in captivity. <coughs> Cheetahs also seem to be uniquely predisposed to develop anthrax. There have been several um, small outbreaks um, in wild cheetahs, both in Kruger National Park um, and in Atosha in Namibia. There also have been several um, small epizootics associated with cheetahs in captivity. Uh, similar to anthrax in other carnivores, they develop um, a different form than what we're accustomed to seeing in our ungulates, in uh, any of the cats or in other carnivores that develop the infection through ingestion of infected um, meat from their prey. They develop lesions, oral and um, cervical lesions, predominantly um, involving the oral cavity under the tongue, large swellings in the mouth, um, sometimes ulcerated hemorrhagic foci in the mouth. They get lymphadenopathy in the cervical area. Um, and sometimes there have been reports of gastrointestinal lesions, markedly edematous um, <clears throat> gastric mucosa, and um, considerable pharyngeal edema. <clears throat> the unique thing with cheetahs is they seem to get a paracute form. There was a recent um, outbreak in Namibia, which was <clears throat> recognized by um, Dr. Ulf Tuberson and diagnosed by Do Dr. Felix Mettler um, at the diagnostic lab there in Windhoek, in which they had cheetahs die acutely overnight. There were five of them that died, um, and they all had anthrax, which they had acquired through the um, feeding of an infect a cow that had died from anthrax. Unlike the more chronic form that's seen in lions and other species, they die with this acute form with virtually no bacteremia, so a, a blood smear is not diagnostic in this case, but they had this marked edema, facial and oral and cervical edema, which if um, an impression smear was made of either the lymph nodes or the tissue in the area, the anthrax was seen in those lesions. And I think <coughs> this is not from a cheetah, but the lesion was similar. This is um, the lesions of anthrax in, um, in a pig, but it's very similar to what we see in carnivores in that you get these swollen edematous hemorrhagic lymph nodes. And again, if you did an impression smear, you would find abundant anthrax bacilli present in the smear. Again, the blood smear was not the diagnostic procedure in this case. <coughs> Just showing the life cycle of that. Cat, in any of the cats, they ingest it and therefore acquire it. Same with the pig, acquire the infection by oral route. But again, it can, it can be quite fatal. It's presumed that the um, cheetah does not have the same level of resistance that hyenas and lions do because they are not um, typical scavengers um, and so that they, do not, they have not developed this innate resistance over time. However, it calls um, to mind their predilection for developing these other infectious diseases. So the unique 
predisposition of cheetahs to get this paracute form is not known. Um, in Atosha, in Namibia, it's, there, it's associated with the congregation of wildlife around these watering holes, and again, you can get a fairly um, dense concentration of uh, the anthrax in these areas. I'd like to shift now from the infectious disease um, that we see in cheetahs to uh, some other rather unusual diseases that we see in very high prevalence within the population, both of which are characterized by a progressive fibrosis, and both of which the cause is not yet been proven. Uh, these two diseases, phenoocclusive disease and glomerular sclerosis, are diseases that are rare in other species, but occur in greater than 80% of the captive populations to some degree. We have not found these diseases in any wild cheetahs to date, with the exception of one recent cheetah, which um, was acquired again through um, the Cheetah Conservation Fund um, in Namibia, in which the wild cheetah had both of these diseases present, as well as some degree of gastritis. Um, we subsequently um, determined that that cheetah had a microchip and therefore had obviously been captured and captive held at some point and then re-released. So here's evidence that um, just by captive handling and then re-releasing, we can develop some of these diseases that are found in the captive population. All those cheetahs that have been wild and not wild caught um, have not to date had these diseases. If we start with um, venoocclusive disease, just to describe it in little more <coughs> depth, this is a typical liver of a cheetah with venoocclusive dis disease, which develops um, over time and becomes progressively worse over time. This is a very firm liver, nodular, um, lots of fibrosis, which appears to have a lobular pattern to it. <coughs> if we look at a cut section, this is a fixed section of the liver. Again, there's this radiating fibrosis, which has a lobular pattern to it. Very, very firm liver. The histological pattern of this di disease is quite unique in that it is, is a partial to complete occlusion of the vasculature, leaving the liver. Both the central veins and the sublobular veins become progressively occluded with fibrous tissue. This is a Masson's trichrome stain in which all fibrous tissue is blue, and you can see that the central veins are either completely <coughs> or partially occluded by the progressive accumulation of um, fibrin and then fibrous tissue and subsequent damage to the surrounding parenchyma. Here's another central vein <coughs> showing complete occlusion with fibrous tissue and a radiating fibrous pattern away from these vessels. The result is um, a, an occlusion of the outflow tract and subsequent ascites forms that appears quite similar to FIP and has been confused with that grossly. Eventually, over time, there's sufficient damage to the parenchyma, um, and probably ischemic damage, that there's collapse in the formation. These are all occluded vessels again, and then rarely nodular hyperplasia. But in most cases, it's a slow progressive disease in which there isn't sufficient stimulus to develop the hyperplastic reaction. So consequently, they die of liver failure and vascular occlusion of the liver. <coughs> this is an example of the progressive venoocclusive disease, which then had an acute ischemic event on top of that. So this is ischemic necrosis and ascites. But it differs histologically from that seen with FIP in that there is no inflammatory reaction associated with it. But then grossly, as I said, it can be confused with FIP. So it's important that the liver be examined histologically and stained with a Masson's trichrome stain or other stain to delineate the affected vessels. <coughs> What's happening ultrastructurally? Um, here is a sinusoid blood vessel with red blood cells in it endothelium, and so in the subsinusoidal space, you get this accumulation of collagen um, and fibrin. The hepatocytes early on are relatively unaffected, and eventually this fibrin and fibrous tissue percolates down toward the central veins, accumulating under the endothelium and gradually resulting in occlusion of that vessel. This is an 
case of an acute venal occlusive disease that occurred on top of chronic disease. So here you have occluded vessels and then a secondary ischemic reaction that re results in severe hemorrhagic necrosis surrounding these blood vessels. In generally what we see is a increase of these lesions with age. However, we have had some in very interesting episodes, cases, which has led us to some understanding of the events leading to this disease. In other species, this disease is associated with unusual exposures to toxins, to radiation therapy, I mean, we've been unable to show any correlation with any dietary component, toxin, or other treatment in cheetahs. And again, this is present in greater than 80 percent of the population. However, when we have found um, evidence of events that may lead to this condition, it has been in cheetahs under, again, high stress conditions. We've seen cheetahs moved from off-exhibit breeding facilities to zoos where they're exposed to not only an environmental change but new enclosure mates um, and exposure to the public. And in two groups in which this happened, some of them died of acute ischemic necrosis of the central lobular area and those that survived from this cohort subsequently developed venal occlusive disease six months later. So it appears that this may be some vascular response to stressful events leading to damage to the tissue, the endothelial air, um, region, and subsequent development of venal occlusive disease. They, cheetahs again, become highly stressed in the captive situation and are stressed by, envi by environmental changes um, as well as other um, uh, factors such as in changes in their enclosure mates. So. The other unusual fibrous disease of cheetahs is this glomerulus sclerosis. This is present again in more than 80 percent of the cheetah population. The kidneys grossly are fairly unremarkable. They're just very firm. They're slightly shrunken, um, no particular pattern to them. That's the cut surface, the capsular surface. Again, not a very remarkable gross lesion. <coughs> but histologically, it's quite a remarkable uh, lesion. Again, this is a mesone trichrome stain in which um, Everything that is fibrous has turned blue, and you can see that there's multiple sclerotic glomeruli, as well as extensive interstitial fibrosis. If we look at higher magnification, you can see there is a gradual accumulation of fibrous tissue in the glomerular tuff, with none of the evidence of um, immune-mediated glomerular disease. There's an accumulation of fibrous tissue almost a membranous change originally, subsequently leading to more sclerotic damage until you get complete obsolescent glomeruli. It's also important to notice in this slide that there's an accumulation of fibrous tissue around a lot of the basement membrane of the tubules and, an, and a destruction of the tubules over time. So it's a progressive um, fibrosis associated with basement membranes. If we look at this tulidine blue stained um, thick section in preparation for electron microscopy. Again, you can see thickened basement membranes. You can see no adhesions associated with gl the immune-mediated glomerular diseases and thickened basement membranes around all of the tubules. If we look at this ultrastructurally, this is a glomerular tuft with red blood cells in the blood space. This is your podocytes on the margin. You can see that there is this even marked thickening of the glomerular basement membrane. There's none of the immune complex type deposition within the membranes um, that would suggest that it's an immune mediated glomerular disease. Early on the podocytes are relatively undamaged, um, but they eventually become um, damaged over time. If we look at some of the more sclerotic glomeruli, again very, very thickened basement membranes with the tubules, loss of most of the detail. And you can see that all remains of these glomeruli are a few mesangial cells with loss of all of the other um, components of the glomerular tuft and the residual even thickening of the basement membrane is all that's left of in these areas. Just showing an electron micrograph that the tubular basement membrane has the same diffuse thickening. This lesion is very similar to uh, other conditions in either people, 
in, in humans, the diabetic or hypertensive nephropathy or the typical rat nephropathy. Um, none of the cheetahs had any evidence of diabetes in terms of markedly elevated uh, glucose levels in the blood or any lesions in the pancreatic islets. Also, there was no evidence of chronic hypertensive disease in that the afferent arterioles were not hypertrophied. What we did determine, however, is that, and this is the work of Dr. Warner Bolton, who at the time was um, visiting my lab from uh, Medunsa in South Africa, in which she um, used some antibodies to um, advance glycosylation end products, the pentosamine and pyrroline, antibodies which were um, graciously lent to us by Dr. Monnier from, Monnier from uh, Case Western University. And what these antibodies do is determine if there are advanced um, glycosylation products in this basement membrane, which suggests that the accumulation of the basement membrane and the um, development of this lesion is associated with some degree of leakage of sugars in the area. This is typical, if I can go back one, to the lesions that are seen with diabetic nephropathy in humans and would suggest that a mild level of hyperglycemia was associated with the development of the lesion. In contrast, if we're looking at rat nephropathy, that is usually associated with high protein levels and the majority of the material accumulating in the basement membrane causing that thickening is proteins. So when Lorna Bolton examined this, we found out that there was considerable de development and deposition of advanced glycosylation products in all of these thickened basement membranes, suggesting that this was a lesion that developed from spillage of sugars across the glomerular space. So we're again back to this issue of could this be stress? Very, things, very few things will cause a persistent hyperglycemia um, in the absence of um, insulin resistance, except for um, hyperadrenocorticism or chronic cortisolemia. Um, it's possible that we have a dietary effect here also in high protein diets in captivity, but it would not again account for the persistence of the um, AGEs in these basement membranes. So again, we're coming back to this, could this be a stress-induced disease? So if we look overall at what we have been examining, um, over the last couple of tapes in terms of the diseases of cheetahs. It appears that we have um, a, a disease which is associated possibly with um, some cardiovascular response and possible ischemic damage to the liver. Uh, it's been, uh, it has occurred under these unique circumstances of acute stress. And if you remember back to my mentioning the cheetah being a very unique species, they have a very um, unique cardiovascular system which allows them to be the sprinters or the runners of the cat family but may not be able to let them compensate um, to stressful events. If we look at glomerular sclerosis, it appears that possibly it's due to hyperglycemia, um, a mild level of hyperglycemia and again hypercortisolemia would be the most likely cause. And then back to our infectious diseases, again these appear to be immune mediated disease diseases to some effect. It's not immunosuppression so much as um, dismodulation of the immune system that suggests a Th2 predominant response, which again can occur under hypercortisolemic conditions. So at this point in time, we are suggesting that the reason why the captive cheetah um, is most predisposed to develop these diseases is that they do not respond well to the captive situation. Now many people would argue with that, saying that the cheetah in captivity seems quite calm. Um, they do not seem to be particularly stressed in a captive situation such as the zoo. However, again, we're looking at morphological um, indicators of stress besides these secondary diseases we're seeing, and this is again a cross-section of an adrenal cortex. Most of the cheetahs in captivity have this marked adrenal cortical hyperplasia. Again, back to Karen Terrio's work in which she has shown that there is a significantly higher level of cortisol in captive cheetahs than in wild cheetahs. We also have determined that there are other morphological indications of cardiovascular, um, not, not so much disease as response, ischemic damage, 
In many of cheetah's hearts, we have this, um, this what appears to be ischemic fibrosis following ischemic events. So I'll look at, show you that higher magnification. I'm sorry, for histologically, you will see that this fibrosis is usually associated with the vasculature, with this radiation away from the vasculature, this interstitial fibrosis, which is very similar to chronic ischemic heart disease in people. However, it is not associated with atherosclerosis in any cheetahs and is thought to be a response to ischemic damage. Again, uh, hypothesizing that the cheetah has a unique cardiovascular system um, and possibly a physiological response to stressful events that shuts down um, the normal vasculature leading to ischemic damage. If we look at how cheetahs are, uh, here's a captive cheetah in a cage trapped in Namibia by a farmer, how they respond to um, restraint in any way, to confinement. Um, again, working with the Cheetah Conservation Fund, this is an anesthetized cheetah, wild cheetah that has been trapped in a cage. If you see how leopards and lions respond to this trapping, they're generally uh, quite uh, accepting of it at the time. They're usually pretty sedate, but cheetahs, in contrast to that, um, damage themselves severely on the cages in an attempt to, to get out and clearly have evidence that they are um, stre greatly stressed under the situations of confinement. Lots of injuries. This is the same cheetah. They tear their, knock their teeth out. They rip their nails out. So there's considerable damage um, in response to the stress of confinement. The other very interesting thing we have found through the opportunistic um, acquisition of blood from cheetahs that have, wild cheetahs have been, been captured, um, is that if you look on the first few days of, of cap after they've been captured, each individual point here on the graph is an individual cheetah, and these are the ones, how, how, how many days they've been in captivity. You can see that they have a elevation, a significant elevation of um, alanine aminotransferase, ALT, a, a liver um, cytoplasmic enzyme that's released when there's, there's damage to hepatocytes. And if you look at the normal um, level, which should be around in this range, you can see that many, many of these cheetahs during the first 10 days of capture have an elevated ALT. They also have an elevated AST, but that's not as specific for hepatocytes. What this indicates is hepatocellular damage, and again, coming back to that response of um, the cheetahs that had been translocated in zoos and their acute acquisition of ischemic necrosis in the liver and subsequent development of venal occlusive disease, we are thinking that this is suggesting that there is ischemic damage to hepatocytes under the acute stress of confinement. So just in summary for the cheetahs, if we're looking at some of the um, effects of stress on their um, the development of disease. We see immune modulation leading to p the potential of immune-mediated diseases, such as the helicobacter-associated gastritis. We see immune modulation leading to their inability to rid themselves of microorganisms and developing more severe infections under those conditions. And we see the development of lesions that appear to be unique cardiovascular responses leading to ischemia and fibrosis. So taken together, it seems that we have um, increasing evidence that the cheetah is not well adapted to the captive situation, that they were, again, they are meant to be sprinters. They're meant to, um, for the most part, they are solitary. Um, and so there are several physiological and behavioral characteristics in the cheetahs that seem to be why the captive cheetahs develop um, the diseases and not the wild ones. We come back to the issue of their homogeneity, and possibly it is that their homogeneity not, it not so much causes them to have genetically induced diseases, but rather allows them, um, does not permit them to have the plasticity to adapt to um, changes in their environment, and that they um, are uniquely adapted um, and evolved in areas of Africa, and when removed from that and placed in other locations under different circumstances, that they are not able to uh, adapt to that, that change and develop these diseases in captivity.
we've recently um, determined that there is a new disease emerging in the population which doesn't fall neatly into either the characteristics of their predisposition to infectious diseases or these diseases of fibrosis. This is a new disease we've seen that has developed since about 1996, which we are currently calling leukoencephalopathy. Around that time, some cheetahs were noticed to be showing clinical signs, which were principally that of blindness. They were starting to miss their um, food that was thrown to them, stumble over things, not adapt to changes if they were moved into a different location. These are all captive cheetahs. Some had behavioral changes. Um, some had some neurologic signs, ataxia and convulsions, but the majority of cheetahs had no signs at all. They were older cheetahs, and it was assumed that they were um, just undergoing geriatric problems, and many of them were euthanized, assuming it was renal failure or hepatic failure, the venal occlusive disease and glomerular sclerosis I mentioned earlier. This is the brain of a typical cheetah. It's a rather unique lesion. The studies were done in um, collaboration with uh, Dr. Sandy Dullahanna and Dr. Brian Summers at Cornell University, where they've been helping us with the neuropathology of this. And to date, no one has seen anything quite like this disease. It's a completely unique disease. If you look at this cheetah's brain, you can see that these, these areas of malacia confined to the white matter of the cerebral cortex in the corona radiata. Here you can see the more distinct difference between white and gray matter, and in these other areas that distinction is lost with this cavitation and necrosis. This is the brain of another cheetah. Again, cavitation, this is just malacia in the white matter and this formation of these cavities, a little less severe. In general, it appears fairly bilaterally symmetrical, confined to the cerebral cortex and confined to the white matter quite a unique disease. If we look at it histologically, there's gray matter, again in the cerebral cortex, and loss of the parenchyma in the white matter, prominent blood vessels. If we look at higher magnification, again here's gray matter up in this area, purely a white matter um, lesion with this vacuolation and loss of the parenchyma in the white matter. And if we look at e even closer, the hallmark of this disease are these enlarged astrocytes, these very gomistocytic astrocytes, large prominent astrocytes. You'll notice that there's virtually no inflam inflammation associated with this disease. Again, a higher magnification demonstrating these quite remarkable astrocytes. In the very le early lesions, the most prominent finding is the astrocytic change before there's any loss of either the myelin sheaths or axons. This appears to be neither a primary demyelination or an axonopathy because you can find within these areas um, loss and damage to both of those components of the nervous system. This is a very early lesion. You can see there's a very minimal um, lymphocytic cuff, but as many of you realize, you can find those incidentally in most felids. But if you look carefully, you will see again we have these large, bizarre, astrocytes throughout this area. Just showing one of the more florid reactions, but again, this is the exception and not the rule. And then it's seen in the face of marked loss of the white matter. If we look at these um, by electron microscopy, again, you can see perfectly normal myelin sheaths with normal axons. Some myelin sheaths are fragmented um, and the vacuoles in them, so there's a whole array of damage there, none of which is particularly specific. If we summarize the lesion characteristics, um, and this has been true in all cases, it's cerebral cortical white matter, fairly bilateral. It appears to be a degeneration in necrosis with no um, predisposition to, develop, to affect either axonal or myelin sheaths. Very rarely you get an inflammatory reaction, but the hallmark of it again is this the florid reactive astrocytosis. This slide is from back in June. We now had three more cases, so we're up to 33 affected animals, which is about 10% of the population. And again, this has developed only in the last two and a half years. It's affecting both males and females. You can see that it's predominantly older cheetahs. 
The youngest animal is seven. We've had it in multiple facilities in the United States and one facility in England. So we thought originally that this might be something of dietary origin, but our case in England um, suggests that it might have some other um, uh, cause. Multiple lineages, meaning it doesn't appear to be just um, af affecting one lineage of cheetah in the captive population. There have been several suggested causes, um, some of which have been investigated already. Metabolic disorders, nutritional deficiencies, such as the B vitamins, but of course none of these have the lesions um, characteristic in other species that we are seeing in the cheetahs. Um, possible toxins, of course, none specifically come to mind, or atypical viral infections. We have examined some of these lesions for um, JC polyomavirus, and they've been negative. CDV has been negative, um, and as has coronavirus. Um, we have uh, been doing some epidemiological investigations, trying to determine what concurrent diseases are present. Um, you can see that 100% of them have had Helicobacter, and there have been various other um, diseases associated with it, which I've been mentioning. However, I mentioned also that close to 100% of the population has Helicobacter gastritis. So whether this is coincidental or causal um, is currently not known. There have been some suggestions that there may be some neurotoxin um, produced uh, possibly by the Helicobacter or a response to some of the treatments that, to which these animals have been subjected, but we're in the process of trying to sort that out um, through our investigations currently. If you look at the electron microscopic picture, we've looked at only three cases to date because many of the cases have not been well preserved. You can see you can see normal axonal sheaths, normal axons, as well as, as damage to the uh, myelin sheaths and axonal damage within the same site. Again, neither lesion um, is predominant. Uh, if you look here, though, in this myelin sheath that has been separated, here within the sheath are these unusual particles, which we found in all three cases. Show you some other photographs of them. They're about 90 nanometers in diameter. They have a, um, a coat, a, a rough coat on the surface. Uh, they are not typical of any known virus, don't fall into any of the typical um, categories of virus, and we're in the process of trying to determine what these bodies are. Here's another example. They don't have the internal detail that you'd like to see in virus, um, and some have been internuclear, and the internuclear ones are about 75 um, nanometers in diameter. So we're in the process of trying to determine if this is just coincidental, trying to find out what these particles are, but it is interesting that they've been found in all three cases examined to date. So in summary, we have a new disease emerging in the population at multiple sites, only captive animals to our knowledge to date. Affects predominantly aged cheetahs, um, is a very unique lesion that has not been seen in any other species to date, and we're trying to sort out what the cause is. Interestingly, at approximately the same time in Europe, a neurological disease has been emerging in young cheetah cubs. This has been occurring in Austria um, and has been studied by Dr. Chris Walzer there, as well as in Ireland um, and some other sites in Europe. This seems to affect young cubs between um, about 8 and 12 months of age. It's usually preceded by um, a rhinitis and conjunctivitis, sometimes a fever, and sometimes follows vaccination. Again, whether these are coincidental or causal has not been demonstrated yet. Unlike the cheetah disease in adults, the leukoencephalomalacia, um, what they're seeing is, is predominantly a um, damage to the spinal cord. These cheetahs, uh, they, they're in, um, they appear to be ataxic. Um, some of them it happens quite acutely, and sometimes it, it happens over a more prolonged period of time. Um, what they found is that it is a Wallerian degeneration at the point in which they have been able to acquire material. Again, what precedes this um, lesion has not yet been determined, um, and you find these uh, digestion vacuoles and clear Wallerian degeneration in all tracts within the spinal cord, and it appears to be affecting all tracts simultaneously. Um, the other interesting uh, lesion that was found in this case from uh, Ireland is the, that you find necrosis in the uh, Purkinje cells and the cerebellum. 
although that has not been noted in all cases. So currently the, um, the thought is that this may be an exposure to a, re a unique response to a viral infection. There has been some correlation with herpes virus, although this has not been proven to date. So again, this is a uh, disease, an emerging disease in the population, curiously emerging um, on, the on a different um, continent simultaneous with the leukoencephalopathy. And at the currently, we don't know what's causing either of these. The other disease I want to mention, cheetahs, which is a common incidental finding in aged cheetahs, is this vacuolar change that I referred to with the bovine spongiform encephalopathy. It's unique from that in that these vacuoles are just diffuse within the neuropil, do not appear to be associated with um, neurons. And I have sent these to Dr. Hadlow to determine if he thought they in any way could be BSE. And he said that neither the description distribution or character of the lesion is suggestive of BSE. So we think that this is just an incidental finding. In cheetahs, there do not appear to be any clinical signs associated with it. But it's important that it be distinguished from the other lesions we're finding. These are just the, within our population, those we've seen. They're usually um, aged animals, although not always, um, and are found throughout the world. Some other toxic lesions that we have found in cheetahs um, is oxalate uh, nephrosis. There have been several cheetahs that have developed this recently. And there have been several events in the past in which cheetahs have developed an oxalate nephrosis. The, there are other species associated. But again, cheetahs are overrepresented in the ones that are impacted. We do know that most cheetahs in captivity are on a com common dietary source. And that's been suspected to be the cause of this. There has been. Um, no proof that there is ethylene glycol contamination of the feed. But of course, by the time the cheetah dies from the disease, the source diet has, um, is no longer available. So uh, proving it in this case um, is only um, by association. The lesion is the same as in any other species. You'll just get this swollen edematous kidney. They'll go into an acute renal failure. And you'll get the presence um, of many oxalate crystals throughout um, the renal tubules and necrosis and damage to the tubules in response to these oxalate crystals. So nothing unique about the lesion. Again, just unique in the fact that cheetahs seem to be overrepresented and overly sensitive to this disease. Again, we don't know the cause. Many thelids develop amyloidosis, but again, cheetahs appear to develop it um, more commonly than other species. However, we also have seen um, tuberculo uh, amyloidosis in association with tuberculosis in wild lions. And again, that's something that Prof. Nick Creek from Understaport has been studying. Most of the amyloidosis you see in felids is of the systemic type, the secondary type of amyloidosis. Um, and most of it appears to be deposited in the renal medullary area hepatic sinusoidal area, but there has been report, there have been, um, there has been uh, amyloid found in other tissues, such as the thyroid gland, adrenal gland, um, as well, and in the, as well as in the spleen. In cheetahs, the predilection appears to be associated with the, their high um, prevalence of helicobacter gastritis. And when we look at the emergence of, of renal medullary amyloidosis in the population, you can see that before 1990, we only had about 20% of the animals with this. And that we now have um, many, again, this only goes up to 1995. We now have more than 70% of our cheetahs um, that are sent to us for this surveillance with renal medullary amyloidosis. If you look at the pattern of emergence over time, you can see that it um, follows the development of, of gastritis in the population. This is a graft I showed you before. So it's clearly associated with the development of, hel of helicobacter gastritis in the population. Cheetahs that have renal medullary amyloidosis usually die of acute renal failure from papillary necrosis. There's deposition of amyloid here in the medulla, which strangulates the renal tubules, resulting in um, either chronic atrophy of the um, cortex or acute, again, acute papillary necrosis um, leading to acute renal failure. It's a typical interstitial amyloid that deposits, again, causing ischemic damage. 
to the tubules and overlying cortex. Again, just deposition of amyloid. Dr. Ken Johnson and Dr. Tim O'Brien at um, University of Minnesota have analyzed the amino acid sequence of this amyloid and found out that it is not a unique amyloid in cheetahs, but rather typical secondary amyloidosis. So again, it's their predilection to develop gastritis that leads to the high prevalence of this disease in cheetahs. They also have it in the liver, this typical sinusoidal deposition with atrophy of the hepatic cords. So a very important emerging disease in cheetahs associated with the emergence of helicobacter in the population. This is an immunostain that was done by Dr. Tim O'Brien, demonstrating that this is typical AA type amyloid. Um, nothing unique, again, um, about the amyloid, but rather um, just the high prevalence within the population. So we do have these species predilections to develop amyloidosis. Um, with cheetahs, again, it's type AA, and I'll discuss these other type of amyloid in the next tape. In the last tape, we were discussing the high prevalence of type AA or secondary amyloidosis in cheetahs leading to, to an acute renal failure. Um, while I'm discussing amyloidosis, even though we're still discussing the diseases of cheetahs, I wanted to mention the other species in which there seems to be a predilection to develop amyloid, one of which is black-footed cats, um, in which they also develop renal amyloidosis, but the pattern of it is different than that of the cheetah. Again, this has been characterized by Tim O'Brien and Ken Johnson at Minnesota as type AA by immunohistochemistry. This is a fixed kidney from one of the black-footed cats um, in which they, you have a fairly um, remarkable um, lesion in the, the cortex of the kidney. And if you look at it histologically, the amyloid in black-footed cats is much more glomerular, although there is also an interstitial component, but you can appreciate the extensive amyloidosis in these, this area. Black-footed cats are native to South Africa. We do not yet know if any wild black-footed cats develop this lesion, but we do know that when they are brought into captivity, um, few of them get beyond two years old because of the rapid accumulation of amyloid and subsequent development of renal failure. So quite a remarkable lesion, again, fairly common in a captive population. And the reason for this species predilection is not known. To date, we've been unable to undertake the same comp comprehensive disease surveillance um, that we have in the cheetah to determine if there is an underlying inflammatory disease. The other type of amyloidosis that is unique to a species is that of the development of islet amyloidosis in clouded leopards. Um, you develop this IAPP um, am type amyloid in the islets, which accumulates in the interstitium, resulting in um, isolation and eventual is ischemic damage and degeneration of the islets. Now, the higher magnification, typical islet amyloidosis, but in higher prevalence in clouded leopards than in other species. If we can return now to the diseases of cheetahs, there's been several um, suggestions that their homogeneity should lead to um, number of genetic defects as well as high cub mortality. In fact, in captivity, cub mortality is quite high, but there have been several studies by Tim Carroll's group, Karen Lawrenson, in East Africa demonstrating that cub mortality in the wild is due to lion predation and not to disease. Um, if we look at the genetic defects in the population, besides these predilections I've been discussing and some other changes I'll show you um, subsequently, there are few genetic defects. This slide, again, is from Laurie Marker. Um, those, this is a, a cheetah cub. Um, and you can see that both this defect, and I'll show you another defective cub, again, the slide acquired from Laurie Marker, in which the lesions you're seeing are not really genetic defects, but incomplete um, separation of monozygotic twins, which would not be considered a genetic defect. So there really have been um, virtually no genetic defects seen in cubs to account for um, the neonatal death seen in captivity. Interestingly, cheetahs in captivity um, have very poor reproductive performance, but when 
Dave Wilt took his group from the Smithsonian on, um, out to the zoos to try to determine the cause of this, um, this um, infertility in the captive animals. They found out that they were basically hormonally shut down, that they were capable of responding to exogenous hormones, and the results of their study suggested that it is merely suppression of the reproductive system leading to poor reproductive performance. Again, think remembering that they have significantly higher levels of cortisol in captivity and cortisol can suppress the reproductive system. So many of the reproductive tracts that we receive from cheetahs are quite immature simply because they have not been exposed to the endogenous hormones over time typical of most cat species. I did want to show you, however, some unique incidental findings that we also found in the reproductive tracts of cheetahs that are very common. These are parovarian cysts. They're cystic wolfy and duct remnants, which are found between the ovary and the oviduct. They're very common in cheetahs. They were in initially uh, assumed to be associated with infertility, but we know they are as common in fertile cheetahs as in infertil infertile cheetahs, and therefore they are just an incidental finding. If you look at them histologically, they're typical cystic wolfy and duct remnants with the smooth muscle wall, cuboidal, flattened cuboidal epithelium. This is one of the large cysts. And you'll see that there is some compression of the adjacent oviduct, but nonetheless sufficient um, space for an a ovulated ova to make it to the uterus. So they are just an incidental finding, though they be, can be quite large and notable in cheetahs, very common in cheetahs. This is again showing a, a reproductive tract from a female cheetah. You can notice that it is quite immature, again associated with the very inactive ovaries. You can see an ovary there with virtually no follicular activity on it. This, on this is a parovarian cyst and not a, a tertiary follicle. So again, they have very immature um, reproductive tracts, very inactive ovaries, suggesting um, suppression of the reproductive system. In the male, they have quite small testes. Um, and as I demonstrated before, um, Dr. Joe Gale Howard from the Smithsonian has demonstrated a lot of abnormal spermatozoa. These are, the t these are fixed testes from a cheetah, again, quite small um, and inactive. And many of them have um, what appear to be spermatogenic arrest. Again, this could be hormonal in, um, in cause. And Many of them have testicular degeneration. However, we do have a biased population in that most of the materials um, I receive uh, for our surveillance are from cheetahs that have died from some other disease. So the presence of testicular degeneration may be secondary to their other health problems. Some other um, findings in the cheetah population is the, um, they get palatine erosions due to malocclusion. Um, and this is found in both captive and wild cheetahs. This possibly could be associated with their genetic homogeneity and that, a, that facial asymmetry and malocclusion um, are, are morphological indicators of low genetic um, uh, diversity. What happens secondarily, this is a cut section. Here's the palate of a cheetah. These are associated usually with the first um, premolar and molar in which it actually perforates through the hard palate and they get these secondary sinusitis. So this is a, just a separative sinusitis in a cheetah secondary to these palatine erosions they develop. Very common in both captive and wild cheetahs. Lesions that are incidental but in quite high prevalence within the population are the splenic and hepatic um, myelolipomas and lipomas. Um, this is the cross section of the spleen from a cheetah. You can see that these are quite um, often quite uh, extensive um, and have been misdiagnosed for metastatic neoplasms within the population. So it's important to understand that these are very, very common in the population um, and likely just incidental findings. Histologically, they're just accumulations of adipocytes, sometimes intermixed with myeloid components. Um, they s appear to an originate as just groups of um, just infiltrating adipose cells, you can see some over here, which eventually accumulate, expand and accumulate and extend throughout both the spleen and the liver. Here's a solitary one and a cross section of the liver. Again, need to be distinguished from other more important neoplasms. 
and again just an accumulation of adipocytes in the liver associated with these lesions. Most likely incidental, Dr. Chris Walterell has been exam doing ultrasound on wild cheetahs and has not found any to date. So there is the question as to whether this is diet associated in that we mainly see these in captive cheetahs. Another um, unusual um, prob uh, lesion that's probably an incidental finding also in cheetahs are these um, dilated pancreatic ducts. Here's a small intestine of a cheetah. Here's the pancreas. And all of these bubble-like lesions, multiloculated lesions, histologically are associated with um, expanded ectatic pancreatic ducts. Uh, again, the pancreatic tissue appears normal, and there was no evidence of any pancreatic insufficiency. Um, and so we do not know the clinical significance of these lesions. But again, very, very common in the population. The other lesion that's very common in the population is the, these foam cell foci, also called, called endogenous lipid pneumonia, this accumulation of foamy macrophages under the pleural surface. They're present in most cheetahs and are quite notable in some cheetahs. You can see this whole row of them. They're found in this linear pattern along the margins of the lung or sometimes disseminated throughout the lung, as in this case. But they're very, very prominent, and again, an incidental finding, but important to distinguish from other more significant disease problems. Um, Dr. Gary Bauer in South Africa, an ophthalmologist, um, examined um, many of the ocular lesions that were found in wild cheetahs and determined that most of them were traumatic in origin. Um, in Namibia, where wild cheetahs freely range, there's an incredible bush encroachment due to thorn bush, to acacia trees, um, and found out that more than 75% of the wild population had evidence of laceration damage to the eyes, um, and several of them, um, in several of them, he found um, remnants of thorn in the ocular lesion. So a common um, environmental problem in wild cheetahs due to the change in habitat um, in their range country. This is just showing you the thorn bush, and you can appreciate when they are running rapidly after their prey in this thick thorn bush that they are, would be prone to develop that in um, injuries from that lesion, from those thorns. Other things that are very common are flies and ectoparasites in wild cheetahs, probably just um, incidental findings. So. We also find very high prevalence of um, sarcocystis in cheetahs. We've mainly seen this in captive cheetahs. Again, presumably an incidental finding. So in summary, I'm going to shift away from cheetahs into some of the other felids in the last part of the tape here, if my voice holds up. Um, the cheetahs in captivity um, are very, um, have very high prevalences of unusual diseases, as well as high prevalences of um, infectious diseases. We're in the process of still trying to sort out what this um, pre predilection is due to, but it appears that over our research over the last 10 years that it is a um, fairly um, notable response to confinement, stress, other stresses in the captive situation to which they are maladapted, leading to hypercortisolemia, persistent hypercortisolemia, chronic stress being the underlying problem leading to um, these diseases in the cheetah. I want to now go through some other diseases that are unique to certain species of cat. Um, start with the diseases of snow leopards. This is a very beautiful picture of a snow leopard lent to me by Dr. Mike Worley, San Diego Zoo. This is a gross um, picture of a, a liver, I'm sorry, from a snow leopard um, that also has venoocclusive disease. They're the other species in captivity in which venoocclusive disease is quite common. You also notice that this snow leopard has several of these biliary cysts um, that I mentioned earlier are common incidental findings in cats. But the lesion in snow leopards is identical to that which has been seen in the cheetahs. The livers are very firm, shrunken, radiating fibrosis, leaving a rather um, a typical lobular pattern. This is a snow leopard and cut section. Again, a very firm with um, liver, lots of radiating fibrosis. And histologically, you'll see the same lesion that you saw in the cheetahs here in the middle of the picture. I know it's difficult to see, but that very bright red is the remnant of an original blood vessel, which has been completely occluded by fibrous tissue. Again, central lobular and sublobular vessels. The 
efferent vessels from the liver become occluded, um, resulting in um, ischemic damage to the central lobular areas and subsequent liver failure. If you discuss um, with keepers of snow leopards, they will also say that they are very stressed in captivity, so again suggesting that this is a stress-related disease. We see venu occlusive disease in some of the other felids, species of felids, but only sporadically. Interestingly, recently at um, UC Davis, we've been seeing um, a, a couple of snow leopards with uh, E. coli septicemia. This is one that has um, a fairly remarkable um, pneumonia and subsequent septicemia. Um, again, raising the question of whether stress is modulating the ability of these species to um, re resist normal microbial um, uh, factors in their environment. In this case, it was presumed that the E. coli was coming from the diet. Some diseases unique to our mountain lion or Florida panther um, within the United States. Uh, we have several populations, one of the most unique of which is the Florida panther, which is a subspecies um, of the uh, mountain lion that is isolated in Florida and to date, there are probably less than 30 in existence, and they are highly um, homogeneic, similar to the problem with the, the cheetah. Um, they have recently released um, mountain lions from other locations with the hope of developing some heterogeneity within the population. However, prior to that, Dr. Melody Rolke, as well as others, have worked on many of their diseases and documented that um, besides an environmental problem in which there has, is considerable mercury toxicity in their environment affecting their health, they also have um, very high prevalence of um, cryptorchidism in the population. This is like um, eventual obsolescence to this endangered species. Uh, um, probably more than 70 percent of the population is either unilaterally or bilaterally cryptorchid, and clearly that's not a good sign for a species in general because this is most likely an inheritable trait. Another heritable, um, inherited uh, defect that was present in close to 20 percent of the population is atrial septal defects. So we're seeing in this very um, isolated uh, population with little homo hom heterogeneity in the population um, a, an emergence of several genetic defects. Dr. Steve O'Brien's group has also determined that there is a, a unique lentivirus present in, um, in all of our panthers, including the Florida panther, the Puma lentivirus, but there is no evidence to date of any immunosuppression associated with this virus. So this might again be an, an, um, an indication of coevolution of this lentivirus with these populations. This is uh, testis from a Florida panther. Again, very, very small um, testis. Um, this one was cryptorchid. Um, and, you know, complete uh, uh, absence of spermatogenesis in the cryptorchid testis. And in the testis that are not cryptorchid, there's um, considerable uh, loss of spermatogonia um, and spermatogenic arrest in these areas, and Dr. Joe Gale Howard has demonstrated that there are very, very high numbers of abnormal sperm, again, an indication of inbreeding depression. So we do have poor levels of spermatogenesis in this population. So, In contrast to that, the California mountain lion is a fairly outbred population, a fairly healthy population at the time, and what's been affecting those, um, a those animal populations are more our typical infectious diseases. Um, there is rabies in that area, and some of the mountain lions um, have been suspected of, of having rabies. Um, in fact, one that, has, that attacked um, humans was proven to have rabies. That work was done by Dr. Brad Barr at CBDLS um, up in Davis. Um, Dr. Um, Melissa Chekowitz has been surveying the population for leptospirosis. We have out in California a resurgence of leptospirosis in both our domestic animals as well as wildlife to some of the biotypes which have not been typically seen in carnivores. Um, for instance, the um, uh, Leptospira pomona and um, Bratislava. So we're seeing a resurgence of leptospirosis in the population, and she's trying to determine if it's clinically significant in the mountain lions. Um, so there is a high seroprevalence she's finding, but only rarely do you see disease, but this study is in progress. Um, this is a 
section of brain from the mountain lion that was rabid. It was just a very typical um, neurologic, you know, uh, lymphocytic cuffing, I'm sorry, of the vessels in the brain. Um, and in the hippocampus, there was gliosis um, and some neuronal necrosis, but no obvious um, negri bodies present, but there was strong immunopositivity to rabies virus in this case. Again, this was a behavioral, um, noted by behavioral change in this animal, and the first case proving that there is rabies virus in that population. They also have a unique parasite present in their, um, that's probably an incidental finding in the pyloric area of their um, stomach, um, found very commonly. This is um, Cyclospirura, probably subequalis. It's a common parasite that's seen in other felids too, and it's these nodules, again, probably an incidental finding. Here's another pyloric area of a California mountain lion with these parasites present in them. If you cut them open, you can find this through this little orifice, the presence of these small parasites. Uh, they form, I know this is quite hard to see, but they are, form this central necrotic cavity in which the parasites are present. And then these large um, laminations of fibrous tissue um, encapsulating these organisms. Again, central area with the parasite in it, necrosis surrounding it, and fibrous lamination surrounding it. Quite a unique um, uh, and notable lesion, but seemed to be um, an incidental finding. Again, just laminations encapsulating this parasite. Um, toward the end here of the talk, I'd like to talk about more of the diseases that are common to all felids, rather than species-associated ones. Salmonellosis has been a constant problem in captive felids, probably of dietary source. Um, we sometimes see um, an enteritis associated with it, but I should caution you that it's very common to be able to isolate salmonella from the feces of, of cats in captivity without any evidence of a lesion. So sometimes pathogenic and sometimes an incidental finding. Blastomycosis um, affects a number of felids in the captive situation, again in endemic areas. The lesions are very typical, um, involving the lungs. Uh, this is could be equally, could be the, some of the lesions that were seen with tuberculosis. So again, if you find these big granulomatous lesions, first put on a mask and then proceed to try to determine their cause. But just these um, single to coalescing granulomas, some of these animals had, um, in all of their lungs were consolidated without discrete granulomas. So it would be typical of any of the higher bacteria or fungal diseases in big cats. Just a typical. Um, granulomatous reaction um, with the organism present in the center of it. It was also found in the central nervous system, but just a typical blastomycosis. Nothing unique about the organism, um, but seems to be in more higher prevalence in endemic areas in the big cats than we see in other species. Mm. There's always question of whether the hemoparasitism seen in felids um, is significant or not. Um, this pyroplasmosis I mentioned before. Um, is very, very common in the wild felids, particularly in um, the African lions. There's no evidence to date that there's any um, disease associated with the, this in wild felids. It see, these seem to be more a disease of our domestic felids. Just again showing you these pyroplasms, which are common incidental finding in African lions. Older um, cats from the Panthera group are large aged felids, commonly develop ankylosing spondylosis in captivity. It's first noticed that they develop hind limb atrophy. Often it's um, presenting as ataxia, weakness, um, and they have just a very typical um, lesion of this ankylosing disease, collapse of the disc space, protrusion of disc material, similar to what we see in our domestic dogs, with damage compression of the spinal cord, and of course, subsequent muscle atrophy and other neurologic signs. This is a more severe case in a snow leopard. You can see there's severe um, collapse of the vertebrae as well as the disc, and protrusion of disc material into the, the canal, and marked damage to the spinal cord. It appears that this is associated with um, substrate, and that if they're kept on hard substrates and allowed to um, jump onto um, on and off um, elevated areas in their enclosure, they're much more prone to develop these diseases. 
this is another common lesion. It's just nodular hyperplasia of the pancreas in large cats. Again, just something that's important to know that it's an incidental finding, typical of what we see in our domestic cats, just little nodules of pancreatic acinar hyperplasia. And then again, these biliary cysts, just to remind you that they're common incidental findings in all captive felids. Last thing I wanted to mention in the felid group is the reproductive diseases we've been documenting in cats that are on progestin contraceptives. Many cats in captivity are, um, are con contracepted with any number of um, potent progestins, the most common of which is melangesterol acetate, which is a very, very potent progesterone, a progestin um, that is uh, placed in these silastic implants. Um, and which are then placed subcutaneously or intramuscularly and deliver high doses of a very potent progestin over an extended period of time, usually at least two years, um, there, and these are replaced every couple of years. What we've been doing over the years is documenting the effects of this on the reproductive tract. I'm going to show you a series of photographs um, to demonstrate what's happening with, um, on these cats on progestins. This series um, shows you the cyclical changes that occur in the um, reproductive tract of any um, felid over during the estrus cycle, showing you here's the endometrium, which gradually expands under the influence of estrogen, then develops this papillary secretory phase during the progesterone, but then um, after uh, it, it, after the loss of progesterone, it goes back to its original height. And so there's a cyclical change over time in a t typical cat of any species um, uh, um, with the normal development of follicles and then corporal lutea. What happens when progesterone is given continuously is they never are able to undergo apoptosis and get back to its normal height. And so what happens instead, again looking at its normal height again, is it develops a progressive hyperplasia and development of um, cystic glandular structures um, over time until over eventually you get a very, very markedly hyperplastic and cystic endometrium. This is what it looks like grossly. Their endometrium has been replaced by this, these nodular um, and cystic foci. The entire endometrium um, undergoes this transition which again is, is um, characterized by cystic dilation and hyperplasia of these glands. Some of them undergo some adenomatous change down in this area and a gradual um, increase in interstitial fibrous tissue. All of this, of course, leading to um, infertility because this does not provide a good environment for embryo implantation. This is a spontaneous change we have determined in most cats. Um, however, they're expo when they're exposed to MGA, the changes occur earlier, um, when younger, and they are more severe. So they develop more rapidly and at an earlier age. If you look at the control group, which is the, the open boxes and the filled boxes are the MGA treated group, you can see that there is more severe hyperplasia at an earlier age in progestin treated cats. We've also determined, again, here's endometrial hyperplasia. They develop these polyps, endometrial polyps, quite commonly in the endometrial lumen. Another interesting finding is the extensive mineralization that occurs when they're exposed to progestins. This is a plain radiograph. This is not a barium study. And all of the endometrium in this cat is extensively mineralized. And this cat was exposed to MGA. Interestingly, we have found um, a much lower prevalence of pyometra and inflammatory changes in cats than we, are typical, than we typically see in our domestic dogs exposed to progestins. Nonetheless, they were in higher prevalence. Um, the chronic inflammatory changes were in higher prevalence in MGA-treated animals than in controls. More of greater concern to um, the zoological community is the high prevalence of cancers we have seen in progestin-treated cats, both endometrial, um, myometrial, and mammary cancers. We've been um, studying this for the last several years, and these cancers are highly associated with the exposure, former exposure to progestins. Uh, this is mammary cancer in a tiger. You can see that it 
would be hard to diagnose and that it's not a single nodule but this diffuse infiltratal, infiltrate, infiltrating cancer which um, extends up and involves the skin, the underlying tissue and um, is very aggressive. Most of them have um, this papillary pattern suggesting they're arising from ducts although there's also um, equal number with this rather comedome pattern, a lot of desmoplasia, just a typical mammary cancer um, that we see in our domestic cats. And similar to domestic cats, these are incredibly aggressive. We see high rates of metastasis to multiple organs, so these are um, a very aggressive um, cancer in these big cats. This is a study we concluded several years ago. Um, we have many more cases by now, but we had um, 43 cats at the time, and you can see the majority of them have been exposed to MGA. We see a much higher prevalence in the large cats, but then many more of the Panthera genus has been exposed to MGA than the Felis species. And so we think that this bias toward big cats is it's due to the bias of exposure. Interestingly, they're also associated with the hypercalcemia of malignancy in a quarter of the cases. A lot of this work was done by Dr. Lisa Herrenstein the clinical presentation of these lesions. We also see endometrial carcinoma, um, which is a rather diffuse lesion. You can see it's here walking through the um, wall of the uterus, a very aggressive tumor again, endometrial carcinoma. And 10% of our population had that, which if you can um, appreciate how high that is relative to how commonly we see this in our domestic cats, which is virtually never. Um, again, a very aggressive tumor, again a bias toward our Panthera species, but again that probably being um, a bias of their exposure to MGA. And it was highly associated with MGA exposure in all these cats. Um, begins as this, ra this dysplastic change, but then you get invasion of the myometrium. You can see the cancer compared to the normal endometrium. Um, the morphology is quite different, just typical of endometrial cancer, um, a fairly well differentiated cancer, but very aggressive, being very infiltrative and extending into the pelvic serosa as well as metastasizing widely in the body. Other adverse reactions we've seen to our exposure to progestins are varying types of skin disease, um, behavioral changes in these animals and weight gain. So in general there have been a lot of adverse reactions to the progestins and we're in the process of trying to find um, a alternative contraceptives that cause less disease in these species. Another adverse reaction that has been suspected but not proven is diabetes. This is a cat that has vacuolar damage to the pancreatic islets that was on progestin contraceptives. But again, this has to date only been suspected and um, a causal relationship has not been demonstrated. Although it has been shown in other species that progestins can lead to metabolic changes resulting in diabetes. We also found during our surveillance of the population for these adverse reactions, a very high prevalence of Lyomyomas within the population, many of which are within the walls. Again, these, this is a fixed uterus um, from uh, one of the zoo cats, but many of them are pedunculated like this. But they extend anywhere from the ovarian parenchyma itself all the way down beyond the cervix. We're very common in the population, but interestingly, we're unassociated with MGA treatment. So, in a recent summary, of this um, population, which was done by Dr. Lisa Chassie from the University of Tennessee. In working um, in my lab, she found that there were the 20, 22% of the population had lyomyomas, but um, mainly in older cats, but not associated with MGA. So again, a very common finding in cats, um, just an incidental finding in most situations. Interestingly, during the surveillance also, um, a unique species predilection for developing cancers was determined. This is a jaguar. And we found um, within the population um, many cases of ovarian cancer within the jaguar population, but only jaguars developed ovarian cancer. It was not found in any other species. This is a typical um, case in which it's involving both ovaries and extending onto the serosal surface and metastasizing by exfoliation and implantation throughout the peritoneal cavity. 
looks very similar to our cyst adenocarcinomas, um, the papillary cyst adenocarcinomas that we see in domestic dogs. It's the same um, histological pattern and um, tumor behavior. You look at it histologically, these appear to arise from the, uh, the surface of the ovary and they just develop these very papillary um, structures and all of these little papillary um, sections of cancer exfoliate and implant throughout the peritoneal cavity and throughout the pelvis. Um, many of them form big cystic spaces leading to that um, pattern you saw in the gross uh, s photograph of the, an affected jaguar. Again, they form little cystic spaces and papillary, just a typical papillary cyst adenocarcinoma of the ovary, but very, very aggressive. Jaguars also developed a significant, were rep, overrepresented um, in the mammary cancer group. They also appear to be overrepresented um, in uterine cancers, both endometrial cancers and leiomyosarcomas. And if you look overall in the population, although they were only 12% of the total population in our study at the time, you can see that they are 100% of the ovarian cancers and overrepresented in the other cancer group. Um, this pattern of multiple, um, a predisposition to develop multiple um, gynecological cancers is very similar to the situation in women who carry the mutations of the BRCA1 gene. This is the familial breast and ovarian cancer gene, which is now known to be a tumor suppressor gene, in which it, in the families that inherit one mutated copy, um, similar to the mechanism of carcinogenesis with other tumor suppressor genes, if they develop another mutation um, spontaneously, they then are prone to develop um, both ovarian and breast cancer. Uh, so what we have, um, are in the process of doing, um, working with a, uh, a second year veterinary student at UC Davis, um, Angela Hughes, who's in the process of trying to um, acquire uh, BRCA gene uh, DNA from the affected jaguars and compare it to the uh, DNA, uh, the BRCA gene sequences um, in jaguars that are in the wild. Um, what she's done is through um, Dr. Warren Johnson in Dr. Steve O'Brien's lab acquired DNA from many of the wild jaguars throughout their range in different areas to try to compare the sequences to determine what the normal BRCA gene looks like in jaguars and then she will be um, determining if those in captivity which are developing these cancers have mutations. And to date she's been successful in acquiring, this is the BRCA gene um, product which she's been able to develop by PCR. Um, she's found the BRCA gene in domestic dogs, um, in domestic cats, as well as many of the wild jaguars and was now in the process of trying to acquire the genetic material from um, the affected animals. And then by doing, by sequencing these fragments um, as well as other um, areas of the BRCA gene, we hope to de determine if there is a mutation um, within that gene in that population in which we could use this test to then screen jaguars before um, incorporating them in breeding programs in zoos. So a unique model um, of a, a genetic predisposition to develop cancer which uh, parallels that seen in humans. Um, in conclusion, I just want to again go back to some of the original points I was making on the first tape. Um, that of these diseases I've discussed are, um, some of them are more common in some species, but most of them are present, most of at least the infectious diseases are present in both the um, large cats and the small cats. Because of their charisma, of course, the large cats have been um, more highly studied. Um, we have more information on them, but we're in the process of trying to determine more how diseases affect some of the smaller um, cats from the genus Felis. Um, and we presume that most of the infectious agents are as, um, are that they're as predisposed to develop infectious diseases as are the other species. On top of that, we have the issues of stress, which I've been discussing, and also genetic predisposition to develop some diseases. So across the whole um, group of felids, we have a whole spectrum of diseases um, which uh, need to be further studied. I want to come back to this slide I showed at the beginning to again discuss the fact that these diseases we've been talking about are going to have major impacts on these small isolated populations in zoos, but as I mentioned earlier, 
the populations in the wild are becoming equally isolated. They're these fragmented populations with little ability to um, uh, tra transphonate across them, the populations, so that the genetic homogeneity is going to become greater. It's possible in the future we're going to see more and more um, genetic diseases, or as we saw in the cheetah, an inability to adapt to change. We're going to see more and more environmental degradation. We're going to see greater exposure to infectious diseases. And we're apt to see a greater prevalence of all these diseases in the future. If we, as pathologists, don't get involved, um, all of these things, this experiment in progress um, will, will go um, unnoticed. So I think we're in a unique position at this point in time. This is the slide I showed before, to actually determine what is the disease and how that disease is affecting the health of the entire population. How does the disease correlate with the clinical signs? How does the disease um, associate with the microorganisms that are present? Um, and what is the significance of these diet positive diagnostic tests in these animals with diseases? As pathologists, we are the ones who are best able to determine if a disease is significant, whether a microorganism is impacting on the health of an animal, and so we are vital to this team which will in the future um, determine the importance of disease in these populations. So when we have opportunities, we need to do as complete necropsies as possible. We need to take complete tissue samples and archive them um, as um, time and money permits, do as much histopathology as possible, and develop these databases um, on at one site which allow us to determine over time the patterns and prevalences of diseases in these populations. Only, um, only over uh, time will we be able to determine um, if these diseases are significant, but if we are collecting data now, we won't in the future be able to see the emergence of new diseases um, or the uh, changing of patterns of diseases in these populations. Within that context, we should associate ourselves with teams that deal with these conservation programs. These are usually multidisciplinary international teams of which we can have a major um, role in terms of helping them determine policy and understanding the impact disease in these species. Only through all these programs will we be able to assure that we can have both healthy captive and wild populations in the future, and so we can maintain a healthy um, ecosystem of which these large carnivores are an essential part.